this one. I see Barry, right? Yeah, it's a pretty empty room so far. But... Yeah, we're only on the hour. Yeah. So it's a little awkward doing the uh, the chairing when the chair is remote, but the speakers are local. So I don't know. If, I, I hope hope the speakers are local. Okay, it looks like people are still coming in. Um, I see Sam Kumar, Tasha Swami, the other presenter in the room.
Okay, I, I get a few minutes for now, so we should probably get started. It's, uh, I don't know if you are there. Uh, if so, do you want to come up and uh, get ready for the microphone uh, while, while I do the introductory slides? Okay, Tasha, can you do an audio check? I see you're there now. It's taking a little while for the camera to work. Okay, um, I will assume that you can hear me in the room. Uh, if that's not true, please uh, enter the chat. Um, so, um, so uh, welcome everybody. This is the IRTF Open Meeting uh, at uh, IRTF 414. Uh, I'm uh, Colin Perkins. Uh, I'm the IRTF Chair. Um, hopefully you can all see and hear me uh, in, in the room and on remote. So, uh, I would like to begin with the, um, the, the usual note well slides. Um, uh, okay, uh, there's some echo, but hopefully it's not too bad. Uh, so, uh, the, this is the IRTF open meeting. The, the IRTF follows the uh, ITF's intellectual property rights disclosure rules uh, and uh, a reminder that by participating in this meeting and by commenting on the presentations that you, you agree to follow the uh, IRTF pr processes and procedures, uh, including disclosing any intellectual property uh, relating to the contributions that you make. Uh, I'm sure most of you have seen these slides before. The, the, the details are in the documents linked, but uh, um, Essentially, if, if, if you have IPR on the document you're talking about, you, you need to disclose that if you're commenting uh, on the microphone. In addition, uh, a reminder that uh, the IRTF uh, routinely makes recordings of these meetings uh, available, both the, the online and the in-person person meetings, uh, including this one. Uh, and this meeting is being streamed uh, li live on uh, YouTube uh, as, as well as uh, via the usual Meet ecosystem. Um, if you're participating in person and you are not wearing one of the red uh, do not photograph lanyards, then you consent to appear in these recordings. And if you speak at the microphones, um, then uh, again, you're, you're consenting to being recorded. And as I say, the recording is being made available on YouTube. Equally, uh, if you're participating online and you turn on your camera or your microphone and make a contribution, then uh, that, that is being recorded and you can consent to being recorded. Um, and also the, the chat is also being recorded and will be, be made available in the, the usual Jabber archives. As a participant in the IRTF, um, as I say, you, you uh, acknowledge that uh, re recordings of the meeting may, may be made available and that, the privacy, that, that any personal information you provide will be handled in accordance with the privacy policy. Um, and you also agree to work respectfully with the other participants in the IETF and the IRTF. And if you have any uh, um, issues or, or co concerns about that, speak to me or speak with the Ombuds team. Uh, and the, the IETF's code of conduct and anti-harassment procedures uh, linked on the slide also apply to the IRTF. Um, for those of you participating in person, um, 
please sign in using the, the mobile MeetEcho, uh, the, the MeetEcho Lite tool. Uh, we're running the, the queue electronically, so if you have questions, then we're, we're using the electronic queue that's accessed by, via the MeetEcho tool. Um, and keep the audio and video off if you're using the on-site version of the MeetEcho Lite tool. Uh, remote participants, uh, please leave your audio and video off and, unless you're, you're presenting. Um, uh, or, or as asking a question uh, just to avoid feedback uh, in, in the session. Also, uh, a reminder for those of you who are attending the meeting in person, uh, as a COVID safety measure, um, the IETF is requiring those, those of you in, attending the meeting in person to wear an F FFP2 N95 mask uh, or, or its equivalent, uh, and the only exception for that is the, the chairs and the, the presenters who are actively speaking. Uh, in particular, participants who are making comments or asking questions from the floor microphones uh, are expected to wear a mask at all times, in, including while they're asking the, the, those questions. As I say, the, the only exception for that is the, the active uh, presenter at the front of the room. Okay, so uh, as I say, this is the, the IRTF open meeting. Uh, the goals of the IRTF uh, are to complement the standards work being done in the IETF by focusing on some of the longer term research issues. Uh, the IRTF is very much a research organization. It's not a standards development organization. Uh, and while it can publish RFCs, and, and we, we do publish both experimental and informational documents on the RFC series, the, the primary output of the IRTF is, is research, is understanding, is, is research papers. The IRTF is organized as a series of research groups. Um, hopefully you, you can see them on the slide here. The, the Crypto Forum group and the uh, privacy enhancements and assessments groups met earlier today. Um, the, the other groups meant, uh, sort of highlighted in dark blue on the slide are meeting later in this week. Uh, so please do um, look out for those groups uh, this week and, and try and attend the sessions if you're interested in, in those topics. A little bit of uh, research group news. Uh, I'd like to welcome Curtis Heimerl, uh, who's uh, recently joined as co-chair of the Gaia group, the, the Global Access uh, to the Internet for All research group. Um, Curtis will be joining uh, Leandro Navarro, who is um, planning on stepping down from, from chairing that group after this meeting, and Jane Coffin, who is uh, continuing. So uh, I'd like to wel welcome uh, Curtis uh, and, uh, and um, thank uh, him for his service and thank Leandro for his, his many years of uh, service to the group. Uh, and I, I very much uh, appreciate the efforts uh, Leandro has put into chairing the group uh, and I look forward to, to working with Curtis going forward. So thank, thank you both, thank you both. As I say, the IRTF is primarily a, a research organization. We tend not to publish many RFCs. We've had one RFC uh, published since the last meeting um, from the information-centric networking group uh, looking at uh, architectural considerations for um, using an ICN name re resolution service. Uh, but pr primarily, the, the, the IRTF tends not to publish much in the RFC series, and, and the output is, is more in the form of uh, interesting presentations and understanding and, and research papers. To support that, uh, we run uh, the Applied Networking Research Prize, uh, and the, the goal of this prize is to recognize the, some of the best recent results in applied networking research, uh, is to, to um, recognize some interesting new ideas uh, which are potentially relevant to the inter internet standards community going forward, and is to recognize up and coming people who are likely to have an impact on the internet standards process and, and internet technologies. Uh, we're very grateful to the Internet Society, to Comcast and to NBC Universal for their sponsorship uh, of the ANRP uh, that, that uh, allows us to, to make these awards uh, and, and bring, bring people to, to give these talks. And uh, 
what uh, what we're doing today is uh, the, the goal of this session is to 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 make some of these awards. So I, I'd like to congratulate uh, Tasha Swami uh, and Sam Kumar, uh, who will be giving uh, the, their award talks uh, and being, being awarded the, the ANRP in this this session today. Um, Tasha will be, be talking first in a couple of minutes, uh, talking about uh, his work on data plane architectures for, for line rate infer inference, um, and Sam will be following uh, later in the session talking about TCP for low, low power wireless networks. Uh, we have two really really good talks coming, so, so please do uh, please do stick around, pay attention to those, and again, congratulations to uh, Tasha and to, to Sam. Going forward, um, look out for the, there'll be more, more award talks. Uh, Gautam Akiwati, uh, Corinne Kaff, and Daniel Wagner will be giving the talks at ICF 115. Uh, and the nominations for the um, nominations for this, the 2023 awards will be opening in September 2022. So, so look out for those. Uh, um, look out for the nominations opening in, in a month or two. Okay, did the audio improve? Try muting and restarting. Hopefully you can hear me. Okay. Okay, ho hopefully that's better. As, as I was saying, look out for the uh, nomination to the 2023 ANRP um, in September this year. Uh, and um, congratulations to Tasha and to, to Sam who will be, be giving their, their ANRP talks today. In uh, addition to the Applied Networking Research Prize, uh, we also host the uh, Applied Networking Research Workshop, which we organize in conjunction with ACM SIGCOM. Um, this workshop is taking place tomorrow. It's co-locating with the ITF in Philadelphia. Um, so thank you to uh, TJ Chung and Marwan Fayed, who are the, the chairs this year and who've been organizing that workshop. Um, we've got... Um, program of, uh, I think there are four, four really nice research papers, uh, a keynote and some invited talks on novel approaches to protocol specification. Uh, as I say, the, the workshop's happening tomorrow. Um, if you're there in, in person, then uh, please do consider attending. If you're attending remotely, then you can register and, and attend. Um, registration is free for anyone who's uh, also registered for the ITF, although we, we do ask you to, to register separately so, so we know who's attending the workshop. Um, and the ANRW next year will be, uh, again, co-locating with the, the ITF in July 2023, um, which is planned to be in San Francisco. And to finish up, before we get to the talks, uh, I'd just like to um, note that we, we are very pleased to offer a number of travel grants for these meetings, um, both to support early career academics and, and PhD students uh, from underrepresented groups to, to attend the IRTF research groups, um, and a number of travel grants for the uh, Applied Networking Research Workshop. Um, thank you very much to uh, the Travel Grant sponsors, to Akamai, Comcast, Cloudflare, and Netflix uh, for, for supporting that. Um, if you'll you know, please see the, the Travel Grants page uh, linked from the website um, for details of that. Um, and if, if you're interested in sponsoring uh, the, the travel grants in future, or if you're interested in applying for a travel grant, uh, see that web page or contact me for, for details of the sponsorship opportunities. Uh, and again, thank you very much for the sponsors. So that's uh, essentially all I have to say today. Um, the agenda for the remainder of the day um, we have the, the two ANRP award talks. Uh, Tasha Swami will be first uh, talking about Taurus, uh, a data plane architecture for her packet uh, machine learning. And that will be followed by Sam, Sam Kumar's talk on performance TCP for, for low power wireless networks. OK, um, I will at this point switch over to uh, Tasha. Can you check the microphone while I get the slides up? Yes, this okay? Uh, yeah, I can hear you remotely. Is it working in the room? I 
Awesome. Should I get started? Yes, just one, one, one second. If, if you have a, a phone, I can pass you controls. You can control the slides yourself if you have the Meet Echo Lite. Uh, if not, then um, shout when you want to go to the, the next slide. OK, so I should have control over that. Um, while uh, Tusha is checking to see if that works, uh, I'd just like to say that, uh, the, that as I say, the, the first talk today is uh, Tusha Swami, who will be talking about Taurus, a, a data plane architecture for per packet ML. Uh, Tusha is a, a PhD candidate in the electrical engineering department at Stanford. Uh, his research is uh, focusing on the intersection of machine learning, networking, and architecture. And he works on the, the hardware software stack for data plane based machine learning infrastructure and applications. Uh, Tusha is due to graduate this year. I understand he's on the job market. So uh, if, if you like this work, then please do uh, talk to him. Uh, He'll be around at the ITF all week. Uh, and if you find this talk interesting, uh, I believe he's also going to be presenting in the CoinRG session later this week. Um, Tasha, over to you. Awesome. Thanks, Colin. Uh, cool. So um, I'm going to be talking about Taurus, which is a project that uh, me and my colleagues have been working on. And so Taurus is essentially a data plane architecture for per packet machine learning. And go into a little bit of what, what that means. All right. So this here is a quote from a 2015 Google blog. And at that time, uh, Google was already dealing with uh, over one petabit per second of total bisection bandwidth. Um, and it's only grown larger and harder to scale since. So what we're essentially dealing with here is a situation where networks require more and more complex management with higher and higher performance. Um, and so it's, uh, the time is ripe for finding new solutions here. And uh, one of the promising solutions in this uh, area is machine learning. So machine learning can allow us to um, essentially take in data from the network and make progressively better and better decisions as we train our models. And these uh, machine learning algorithms can approximate network functions based on the data they see. And they're also going to customize their operation to the data that they're training on, which in turn means that these machine learning algorithms are actually uh, customizing their models to the network itself. And so we're sort of uh, doing elements of this already with handwritten heuristics in the network. So something like an active queue management algorithm or uh, hashing and load balancing and playing with operator tuned parameters. So all machine learning uh, is doing here is taking the next step by automating the, um, the uh, search for these kind of parameters that allow it to work well within your network. So uh, if we're okay with using machine learning, we now need to examine where exactly in the network it has to happen. So I'm sure many of you are already familiar with software-defined networks. Essentially, the control plane and the data plane are split. And the control plane is responsible for policy creation, um, essentially in the form of flow rules, which are installed into a data plane, where that's where you're going to find your switches. And they're doing packet forwarding via match action. So um, right off the bat, there are two good candidates for where we should operate with machine learning. And uh, on the left here, I have a diagram of the same typical defined, software-defined network. But on the right, uh, I have a software-defined network with the Taurus worldview. And so what we've actually done here is we've split the machine learning operation into training, which is going to happen in the control plane, and then inference, which is going to happen in the data plane. So in the control plane, Policy creation is going to take the form of flow rules plus ML training. And when installing this information into the data plane, it's going to be sending flow rules as usual, but also the ML model weights. And in the data plane, we're going to be doing our typical match action packet forwarding, but we're also going to be doing decision making with ML inference. 
And so that brings me to one of the core tenets of Taurus, and that's essentially that ML inference should happen per packet in the data plane. Um, and so the, the intuition here is relatively straightforward. You wanna be able to do per packet operation because that is the finest granularity of traffic essentially operating on a packet scale. Now, not every application may need per packet um, uh, level operation, but the there are applications that need it. And so the platform should be able to support per packet operation. And then the data plane, that's where the packets are. So if we're gonna be doing decisions on packets, it should happen in the data plane. Oh, I think uh, PowerPoint animations don't play well with the PDF. Um, so that's okay. Uh, what, what, what's basically happening in here is that um, if we were to do just a rough off the, uh, off the cuff math here, so you have traffic at one giga packet per second moving through your data plane. Now, in the time it takes you to send a packet digest from the data plane up to the control plane, calculate flow rules, and then install it back into the data plane. In this case, we've assumed um, uh, half a millisecond for each step. So we've now missed 1.5 million packets in our traffic stream by the time uh, we had flow rules installed into the data plane. So in the example here, we're doing anomaly detection. So we're trying to find out if incoming packets are malicious or benign. And maybe if we find that it's malicious, we're going to install some rule to say block that IP. Um, and by the, so if we've missed 1.5 million packets during this flow rule installation time. By the time we block that IP, we've already let a ton of uh, potentially malicious traffic into the network. So the whole takeaway here is really just to um, show you why we can't let um, our operation for these kind of this level of application happen in the control plane. And if we're committing to using machine learning, we can't have inference happen in the control plane. So fundamentally, the conclusion here is that the robustness and performance of your network are going to be determined by the quality of your reaction and the speed of your reaction. So in the machine learning worldview, the quality of the reaction is gonna be determined by your training data. So how much do you have? What kind of cases does it cover? How well is it cleaned? But also your speed of reaction. So in the case of the anomaly detection, um, you wanna act on a malicious packet the moment you see it. You don't wanna to have to go to the control plane and come back and install any sort of flow rules. And um, this is essentially the per packet operation in the data plane. So zooming in on uh, the control plane, let's talk a little bit about the actual implementation of how you do this. So I mentioned before that we're going to split our machine learning uh, into training in the control plane and inference in the data plane. And so the key here is that training is off the critical path. If packet, forward is ha packet forwarding is happening in the data plane, then uh, the control plane is not uh, responsible for making uh, per packet level decisions, which means that we can do our machine learning training there at leisure. And um, essentially we can, we can put in whatever the latest and greatest ML accelerators are, whatever your favorite ML framework is, um, install it in a control plane server and have it training models offline. The trickier part comes in the next step where now uh, we need to deal with the actual critical path, basically um, tackling packets as they come. So machine learning inference here is going to happen in the data plane, like I mentioned. And the, the final outstanding question here then is if we're okay with doing uh, training in the control plane, we can use whatever existing hardware we want. And then what do we do about the data plane? Do we have say a switch that can do inference um, at line rate per packet operation. And so this is really the, the crux of Taurus and that's what it aims to do. So Taurus is an architecture for per packet machine learning inference in the data plane. So uh, let's jump into the actual hardware um, and how we enable this kind of machine learning inference at line rate. 
So I have a picture here of a piece of pipeline, a protocol independent switch architecture. So this is the typical uh, programmable structures you'll find in these kind of uh, switches. So some sort of programmable packet parser, match action tables that allow you to encode your network functions, and then uh, maybe a programmable traffic manager. So we're going to actually keep most of these elements um, and just make a modification of additional hardware that'll allow us to do our machine learning inference. Um, but the natural question is, if we're, if we're committing to adding hardware into the switch pipeline, um, what does that look like? And more specifically, what is the abstraction here with which we're going to create our programmable machine learning um, fabric? And so in Taurus, we use the MapReduce uh, abstraction. So MapReduce is really useful for machine learning because it supports a lot of the common linear algebra operations that you need for your ML algorithm. So this covers everything from um, neural networks, support vector machines, k-means, um, all these different kind of applications. And uh, just as an example I have here in the picture, um, uh, an example of a single neuron from a deep neural network so you can see exactly how map and reduce are applied here in this case. In the blue box, um, we are doing an element-wise multiplication, that's our map with multiplication, with inputs and weights, and then we're applying a reduction. And so this is going to um, essentially add all the values together, and um, you're going to produce a, a scalar value from your vector of inputs. And then finally, we're gonna apply an activation function. And so that suffices for a single neuron, but you can mix and match this pattern ad nauseum uh, to create a full neural network. So by stacking extra uh, of these blocks um, in parallel, you'll be creating a, a layer of neurons and then stacking them sequentially, you'll be creating multiple layers. And so that's how you can create, say, a deep neural network. So the other advantage of the MapReduce pattern is uh, comes from the kind of performance that it enables. Primarily, it's a, from the, the SIMD parallelism, so it's same instruction, multiple data. So we can get a lot of performance out of the parallelism with minimal logic. And uh, this is as opposed to what you might find in, a, say, like a, a, a typical like Tofino pipeline, where they have VLIW pipelines, which give you much more flexibility but the cost here is that there's a lot of logic that's needed for the communication hardware. And um, that ends up taking up a lot of the, the overall on-chip area. And uh, in addition, SIMD parallelism gives us the ability to um, unroll the loops in our, um, uh, in our algorithms. So the, the idea of unrolling here, if we take the example of um, say a single layer of a neural network, and say you have four neurons in your network, you can either um, execute them sequentially, you're doing one neuron after the other, or if you have the resources, you can instantiate all four of them in parallel. And so the trade-off here is that more unrolling is gonna give you better performance, essentially doing all four of those neurons at once, while less unrolling means you only need the hardware for one single neuron's worth of operations, but it's gonna take you four times as long. So it's less resource intensive, but it's also uh, uh, much less, um, a much higher latency. And, uh, but we get this kind of control with the SIMD pattern by um, essentially un adjusting unrolling factors. So, we went ahead and we uh, essentially adjusted the switch pipeline with a MapReduce unit that uh, implements the patterns that I just described. So the, the it, we still have our typical um, programmable elements. We have a programmable packet parser, match action tables, and traffic manager. But you can see in the center, we have this MapReduce unit. And that's essentially what's going to do our machine learning inference. And so there are a couple uh, little idiosyncrasies about the, um, the arrangement of the pipeline that I wanna point out. And, uh, and that's how we use these different elements for machine learning context, even if they're typically 
uh, network elements. So a packet parser is normally for pulling out your headers from your packets um, and doing whatever you want with your match action rules. In this case, packet parsing is also pulling out the features for our machine learning um, inference. And then we have match action tables before and after the MapReduce unit. And so these are doing different types of rule-based pre- and post-processing on our machine learning inputs and outputs. So uh, the match action tables before MapReduce can be doing some sort of cleaning on the features. And then the match action tables on the output um, on the right side of the MapReduce unit can be doing some sort of uh, interpretation of the results. And uh, so when we actually went to design this MapReduce unit, um, there's uh, a couple of things that came up. It turns out you can't really just stick an accelerator into a, the switch pipeline. So uh, what we did was we kind of established what were the, the points that we wanted our MapReduce block to fit. And so most of all, we wanted it to be reconfigurable. So essentially, you should be able to program it. It can't be a, an ASIC for a single type of machine learning application. You should be able to put in whatever or program whatever application you want. Oops. And um, it has to meet line rate with the fixed clock. So this essentially uh, rules out an FPGA because an FPGA will give you a variable clock. We want it to be deterministic. Um, and of, of course, line rate is our performance requirement. And then minimal area and power overhead. We don't want to blow up the entire chip area, adding in like uh, a MapReduce block. It should be something that is uh, small, but gives you access to a whole class of applications. And so finally, the one little thing to note here that's kind of interesting is that most of these ML accelerators are built to do uh, batch processing in an effort to get high throughput. But in the network pipeline, you're actually um, processing packets as they're coming, which means that you're operating on a, a batch size of one, um, which is uh, turns out puts a lot of different performance demands on the hardware than a typical accelerator would see. Uh, yeah, so um, I have a quick example here just to make this a little more concrete. Going back to anomaly detection, um, so you can you can uh, imagine say a packet coming into the switch pipeline, and we want to see essentially whether it's malicious or benign. So the packet hits the first stage, and that's where we're going to um, do our packet parsing. So we're going to read local features, say our IP, whatever information we can extract from the packet itself. The packet is going to move to the second stage, which are the match action tables. And from there, maybe we're going to do some sort of uh, retrieval of out-of-network events. So these would be different kinds of uh, elements of metadata that the control plane may have installed into the match action tables. So something like the failed logins per IP. The packet then moves to the, the center block, the MapReduce unit. That's where we're gonna apply our learned anomaly detection. So you can imagine this is maybe a binary neural network and it gives it a, a score from zero to one on how anomalous it is. So one is definitely anomalous, zero is benign. And finally the match action or the the packet will move to the post-processing match action tables, and that's where we do our interpretation. So say I, we got a score of 0.8, so it's pretty anomalous, and uh, now we want to drop it or quarantine it. This is where the match action table will set a rule for that, such that when the packet now moves to the traffic manager, it's going to go to the appropriate destination. So, uh, in the uh, paper, we actually did a full um, ASIC analysis of uh, this Taurus hardware and how we can, um, we wanted to show essentially that it has minimal overhead and it's feasible to, to build something like this. And so we based our evaluation platform on a coarse grain reconfigurable architecture called Plasticine. And we programmed our applications in the spatial hardware description language. And so spatial is just an HDL that lets you um, use these kind of uh, parallel patterns like map and reduce to uh, program your, um, your, your reconfigurable architectures uh, at the loop level.
And so the, the basic architecture of the MapReduce unit here is really just a grid of compute and memory uh, tiles. So easily scalable and very, very straightforward. In the compute units, we have SIMD lanes that are operating in parallel and a reduction network that allows us to implement the reduce operation. And the memory units are just um, blocks of banked SRAM. So uh, we're doing pi severe pipelining within the compute unit, but then we're also doing pipelining one level higher between the compute and memory units. So the idea here is SIMD parallelism everywhere uh, and then pipeline parallelism everywhere. And that's how you get your performance, really. So uh, we went through a set of real-world applications and um, programmed them onto our ASIC. And we ended up using a 12 by 10 grid to support all of them. And um, we compared it to state-of-the-art switches with four uh, pipelines. And um, it, our, our reference switch was 500 square millimeters. And we found that our, our grid, which could support these different applications, was only adding a 3.8% overhead or 4.8 millimeters per pipeline. So um, again, before, uh, earlier I said we want minimal area overhead. So 3.8 is pretty low, given that you're now getting an entire class of machine learning applications. Um, and jumping into one of these uh, applications, I've been using anomaly detection as a recurring example here. Um, we tried out two different types of anomaly detection with support vector machines and a deep neural network. And so uh, uh, for both models, you can see in the throughput, it's one gigapacket per second, which is the line rate for um, high-end uh, switch pipelines like your Tofinos and Broadcoms. Uh, the latency that we added was in the um, hundreds of nanoseconds or less. So in this case, you would choose your application. You can see here that the BSVM requires 83 nanoseconds while the DNN requires 221 nanoseconds. So depending on your SLOs and what kind of requirements you have to meet, you can choose your algorithm to reduce latency. Um, and then in both cases, the area and power overhead required for the hardware to implement just these applications is um, sing single digits or, uh, or less, so 0.6% uh, power overhead, 0.5% area overhead, or 0.8 and, uh, and 1.0, respectively. Uh, again, if you don't need, um, say, the full suite of benchmarks, you only want uh, a reconfigurable fabric that will let you do anomaly detection. You can do it with um, minimal overhead here. And so in the paper, there's a, um, several more applications if people are, are interested, such as um, a congestion control network and a traffic classification network. So, uh, we went through this whole process of doing an ASIC analysis to prove that it could be done. Um, but as far as research goes, we don't really want anyone waiting for some sort of mass produced Taurus ASIC. So we've put out an open source FPGA based test bed. Um, and so this is just a rough diagram of what it looks like um, at the control plane. We're using uh, your typical network OS like ONOS. Um, we're using a Tofino switch to to mimic the piece of pipeline elements like your programmable packet parsers, match action tables, and traffic managers. And then we're using an FPGA to, um, uh, to mimic the MapReduce unit. So we set it up in this bump in the wire configuration. Um, and so uh, because of the limits of an FPGA, you're not going to be able to hit the same performance as you're gonna get with the ASIC uh, coarse grain reconfigurable architecture but it's there to serve uh, as a proof of concept for the functionality. So just a quick demonstration of this uh, test bed. Um, we did an example, essentially the example I mentioned earlier about anomaly detection where we're trying to do uh, detection of anomalous packets in the control plane or we're trying to use TORS and do anom uh, anomaly detection in the data plane. And so with the test bed that I just showed you, you can do um, 
you can do either. So you, so in the case of Taurus, we'd be uh, placing our anomaly detection application on the FPGA, while if we're trying to do control plane based anomaly detection, we would run it at the uh, the controller on the CPU. So uh, the takeaway here is is the same sort of message on um, why you really can't use the control plane for efficient um, machine learning dis based uh, decision making. And um, if you take a look at the very uh, last two columns, the F1 score, um, now this is the F1 score for the model when it was implemented on the baseline, which is control plane or Taurus, which was in the data plane. And in software, in TensorFlow, uh, the F1 score is 71.1. So you can see that Taurus on the far right side of, of the uh, the, uh, the, uh, the table is achieving an F1 score of 71.1. So it's faithfully recreating the model as it was in software. And um, we're processing packets as they're coming in. Whereas in the control plane, we actually had to sample packets from the network and um, run it through the control plane and run it through uh, an ML framework and try to install flow rules. And what ends up happening is that you miss so many packets while doing this operation that your effective F1 score uh, drops pretty heavily. So you can see on the far right column, the F1 score for the baseline um, ranges from 1.5 to almost, almost zero. So you're effectively throwing away your model because of the added latency. So that's just uh, one example of what you know what we did with our FPGA test bed. Um, there's of course lots of other things you can do, but the just to reinforce the point why you have to operate in the data plane. Cool. So yeah, so that's mostly it uh, for me. Um, I have my contact information here, and I have at the bottom the a GitLab link for the FPGA test bed. We hope people want to can uh, try it out and there's the link to the full paper in this right. easy to memorize url so uh yeah i'm happy to take any questions okay uh thank you very much uh, for the excellent talk um since we, we have uh, some people remote uh, and some in the room, I think if, if we can manage the queue using Miteco, uh, the Miteco queuing tool, I think that would be helpful. Uh, I do see, I guess it's Barry at the microphone there. Okay, actually I'm being uh, Dave Oran right now. Um, Dave Oran asks, I assume the class of anomalies you can detect are those that can be detected by header fields within the width of the ALU of the switch. Things in the packet data beyond the headers won't be seen. Is that correct? Um, so the in the case of anomaly detection, we used uh, the KDD NSL data set, which had a, a record of different um, attacks that were calculated from, like you said, either header fields or um, you can also actually calculate aggregate fields from across headers. So you can, um, uh, say, create like a histogram using the match action tables across different packets. Um, and the, the packets, the, uh, the packet headers um, are going to be limited by the packet header vector size that's moving between stages in the switch pipeline. But you don't necessarily need to be limited to features in the header because the control plane can install different types of metadata into the match action tables and you can do your own um, processing in the match action tables um, over time or whatever other kind of calculations you want to do on your headers. So the headers are just the starting point for the, the features here. Hi. Is this working? Okay. Yeah. George um, Michelson, can I sneak yeah. two, can I sneak two questions in? Is that okay? Yeah. So the first one, and this is the naive attendee question. I suspect the paper is very important for interpreting that last table. It was really quite opaque how to understand the meaning of the columns and their impact on a comparison to the baseline. I think there's a lot of implicit knowledge 
in your table structure. Sure. I'm sure the paper explains it, the slide where it was just a bit obtuse to a naive reader. So at the start of your talk, that was the first point, you made a case to say that the delay between doing a packet sample, constructing table match rules in the controller, injecting those rules down into the functional plane and applying them had a huge packet loss and mismatch interval. But it seems to me the delay to perform the ML operation, tune your ML, have a model that is representative of the condition you want to model, and then install that has a similar cost. It's not to say there's no benefit of ML, I think it's huge, but the component that's about the delay cost of doing an instantiation of rules, I don't think is a basis of doing it. I think you're on stronger ground arguing it's about the ability to do complex match at line rate than the static cost of doing the rule installation. Right. So um, the installation, you're right about the installing the model itself. So the idea is that you could be taking sampling uh, packets from the, your network and be sending different kinds of metadata to the control plane and essentially be doing your training offline and you can install model weights or replace model weights as, uh, as needed. The idea is that whatever is operating in the data plane itself has nothing to do with the installation of model weights. It's yeah, I, completely I, agnostic. Of and the and I, thought, I thought that idea that you could do the model training asynchronously at a sample exactly. rate is, is yeah. very beneficial. Mm -hmm. But if you consider a new class of attack, that mm -hmm. you have to understand it and do some form of Bayesian analysis and classification, which is completely unmodeled here. Exactly right. how you do that training unknown, how long that takes. It's not about the speed of the chipset, it's about your ability to do the good, bad classification a priori to inform the model and then download it. That's quite a high cost in time. Yeah, so so this is always like kind of the uh, the trouble with security, right? Like if you want to do an on-the-fly analysis of a brand new attack, that's not really uh, what we're what we're targeting no. at the moment here. But, no, uh, but in engineering terms, your case, this is extremely fast at line right. Well made. I enjoyed listening to it a lot. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, excellent work, Tushar. Uh, I have a question. Doing machine learning in data plane will consume more energy. Oh, sorry, I can't. Uh, uh, do, do, uh, using machine learning in the data plane mm -hmm. will consume more energy. Mm -hmm. So, and we would like to reduce the energy consumption of sure. routers and switches. So have you looked at this issue? Yeah, so I think the, the for energy consumption needs to be looked at maybe more holistically. So while you are increasing by some small percentage the energy that you'd be consuming in the, the switch itself, you can consider that, say, if you're doing anomaly detection, you're removing the cost of running an anomaly detection application in software on a server somewhere else. So with this like specialized hardware here, you're consuming less power in the switch than you would running it in software elsewhere. Okay. So uh, on the whole, you're reducing power costs, but for the switch itself, yeah, you'd be increasing it minimally. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, anyone else have questions for, for Tusha? And I guess while we're waiting for that, uh, I, I have a question. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, uh, this, this is a, an IETF uh, meeting which is, which is co-locating with the IETF. Um, and obviously, you know, since the, this co-locates with the ITF, the question is then, you know, to, to what extent have you given any thought towards how, the, how this might change or affect the, the type of work the IETF does? Um, are, are there any implications of these types of systems for, for the way we, way we design standards or other types of protocols that the ITF does, designs? Or is this just a, a, an optimization that fits within the existing architecture? Yeah, I think um, so. One of the the things that uh, actually uh, Hashemu, who uh, uh, asked the question earlier, um, brought to my attention was that was what kind of um, standardization is needed for packet headers 
if we're going to be using them as um, features or carrying model weights or basically doing kind of this um, like ML, uh, ML assist type operations. Um, so I think there's probably something there as far as um, making a cleaner definition of what, what has to happen at the, uh, the, the packet standardization level um, to support this kind of machine learning, make it uh, easier for different, different types of ML systems to, to op interoperate. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Okay. Um, uh, pr presumably, the, there's also something in terms of the control plane and, and the standardized um, sort of programming mo model for that to, in order to, 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 to specify the, the, the model. Is that right? Uh, sorry? Uh, sorry. I, um, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking that your traditional pro programmable switch uses P4 or something like that as a programming model. Do, do, do we need a, a similar standardized programming model for the, these types of ML switches? Uh, oh, or, yeah, so, um, yeah, so so as like kind of a complement to, to P4, um, we went with MapReduce, so we're not necessarily married to the idea of using um, a map produced blocker and then the the bigger idea here is just doing inference in the data plane um, so but yeah it could definitely help to have some sort of standardization in the way that p4 works but for um, the the map produced elements so uh, you could even consider like an extra control block in p4 as map produced and we actually we have another paper and submission on um what the the language level constructs here look like so yeah there's it's definitely a, an area for standardization as well all right great thank you very much uh, are there any any final okay uh, i don't see anything so thank you very much All right, Sam, if you can come up while I try and share the slides. All right, so can you see the slides? Yes, we can see the slides here. Okay. All right, so with any luck, you should now have control over the oh, slide. Have they gone away? Oh yeah, I see. I had a quick share. Okay. Uh, here we are. Just took a little while. Yeah. So, okay. So, yeah. Okay. Great. All right. So the, the second talk today is um, focusing, I think, on a, a very different problem domain. Um, so in, in this talk, Sam Kumar will talk about his uh, paper on performant TCP for, for low power wireless networks. Uh, this was originally presented at the NSDI conference in 2020, if I, if I remember correctly. Uh, Sam is a, a PhD student at UC Berkeley, uh, advised by David Culler and Rolaka Ada Pupa. Uh, he's broadly interested in systems, security, and networking, and his research focuses on rethinking systems designed to manage the overhead uh, of using cryptography, uh, and presumably also uh, improving the performance of TCP for, for low power wireless networks. So, um, Sam, uh, over to you. Uh, Okay, um, thanks Colin for the introduction. Um, as you said, I'm Sam, and I'm gonna present uh, my research on performing TCP for low power wireless networks. And this is a joint work with my collaborators at UC Berkeley. Uh, and as you mentioned, it was published uh, in 2020 at NSDI. So uh, I'm gonna begin by giving a brief overview of, of history of research in low power wireless personal area networks or low pans uh, to put our research in context. So low pan research began in the late 1990s. And at this point in time, researchers deliberately cast away the internet architecture based on the idea that low pans may have to operate in two extreme environments and two different 
uh, from regular networks in order for the internet architecture to directly apply. So many of the early protocols like SMAC, BMAC, and so on, and the early systems like TinyOS and Contiki did not conform to any particular standard or architecture. And this allowed the researchers to nicely explore how to tackle the challenges of low pants without being hindered by having to conform to an architecture. About a decade later in 2008, IP, the internet protocol, was first introduced in the space, largely enabled by the six low pan adaptation layer standardized by the IETF. And what happened here is that people found ways to take the lessons that were learned in the earlier systems and apply them within an IP-based architecture. And this essentially caught on uh, in a few years. By about 2012, IP had essentially become the standard in the space. But surprisingly, the adoption of IP did not come with TCP. For example, OpenThread, uh, a low-pan network stack developed by Nest and used in, uh, in the smart home space, didn't even support TCP. And instead, uh, the community has come to rely on protocols like CoAP, uh, which are specialized low-pan protocols based on UDP. It's also worth pointing out that during this time, low-pans have not yet achieved the same kind of pervasive adoption that we've seen uh, in other protocols like Wi-Fi, at least in the context of granting internet access to devices. So a natural question is whether to get that kind of pervasive adoption of low pans, we should adopt not only IP, but also the broader set of IP-based protocols, including TCP. In this context, our work completes the transition of low pans to an IP-based architecture by showing how to make TCP work well in low pans. And a research artifact is TCP LP, a performant TCP stack for low pans. So what exactly do I mean when I say performant? Well, one metric is good put, and that's the amount of bandwidth that an application is able to get when operating over a TCP connection. Now, there have been a few prior attempts to use TCP in the space, uh, typically based on a simplified embedded TCP stack, like micro IP or blip. And what we can see in this graph is that our work, TCP LP, achieves significantly higher good put than prior attempts to use TCP in this space. In fact, we can calculate an upper bound on good put, shown by these dashed lines, based on measurements of how fast the radio can send out packets and how much overhead is lost to headers and acts and so on. And our work comes quite close to these upper bounds. Um, I'd also like to share an update uh, that's happened since we published this research, which is that OpenThread, the low power network stack that I mentioned that's used in the smart home space, recently adopted TCP directly based on our research. Uh, it uses TCP LP as its TCP implementation and the research also influenced Thread the network standard that OpenThread implements. So I'm delighted to have been invited to spear help spearhead this process, and I am hopeful that, uh, that the adoption of TCP in the space will help improve the adoption of low pans more broadly in the smart home space. So now I'm going to take a step back and provide some more context as to what exactly low pans are and what some of the challenges are with using low pans. And I can do that by comparing low pans to other wireless technologies that you might be more familiar with. So on the left, Wi-Fi provides a host with internet access via an access point. In the middle, Bluetooth uh, doesn't really provide full internet access. It's more like a cable replacement channel, a wireless USB of sorts. And then on the right, we have low pans, which aim to provide internet connectivity at the same level as Wi-Fi would, uh, but to embedded devices and while operating within the constraints of low power. For example, having to transmit data over multiple wireless hops to set up an embedded mesh network. So low pens have been used in a variety of applications, for example, scientific applications like environmental monitoring, structural monitoring of a bridge, um, and it's also been deployed in the indoor environment in a smart grid context. And recently, there's been a push to deploy it in the smart home and IoT space, and the thread and open thread efforts I mentioned earlier are one such attempt. Uh, but despite being useful for all these applications, it's difficult to use low pens because they also come with a set of challenges. The first set of challenges come from the resource constraints, the fact that the embedded hosts have limited CPU and memory resources. Uh, the second set of constraints come from the link layer. Uh, low pan link layer, like for example, IEEE 802.15.4, has a small MTU of only about 100 bytes and has low wireless range, which means that in order, to, in order to get connectivity over a large area, you need to transmit data over multiple wireless hops. And finally, energy constraints are also an issue. Uh, you typically don't have enough energy to keep your radio on and listening all the time, so you duty cycle your radio. What that means is that your radio is actually in a low power sleep state 
for say 99% of the time, and then 1% of the time you can turn on your radio to send or receive packets. And in order to provide an always on illusion to applications, despite doing this to save power, we need some careful scheduling at the link player in order to make sure the data is only sent to a node when this radio is on and ready to receive that data. So to make this more concrete, uh, I'm going to tell you about the platform we use in our research. It's called Hamilton, and some of the stats of this platform uh, are on the slide. The key point here is that this kind of device is more powerful than the devices we had when low band research first got started in the early 2000s, but it's still substantially less powerful than even a Raspberry Pi. Uh, you cannot run Linux on a device like this. Instead, you have to run a specialized embedded operating system. And you can understand our research as tackling the central question of how should a device like this connect to the internet? And the result of our research is that we show that TCP IP works well. Now, as I mentioned earlier, the adoption of IP in this space did not include TCP, and that was no accident. The reason is that researchers had doubts as to whether TCP would work well, and they expected it to not work well, given the challenges of low pens. So here are some quotes I've taken from some research papers to show some of the concerns that the community has had about using TCP. The first one is that TCP is not lightweight and may not be suitable for implementation in low-cost sensor nodes with limiting processing memory and energy resources. The second one is that certain features of TCP may cause harm. Like for example, that the connection-oriented protocol aspect of TCP is a poor match for wireless sensor networks, where actual data may only be in the order of a few bytes. And finally, there's the wireless TCP problem. The idea that TCP may use a single packet drop to infer that the network is congested, which can result in extremely poor performance because wireless links tend to exhibit relatively high packet loss rates. So again, to summarize more simply, there's concern that TCP is too heavy, that its features are necessary, and that it will perform poorly in the presence of wireless loss. So central to our research was understanding TCP's performance. And what we did is we did a study where we actually ran TCP in a low pan, measured its performance, and tried to draw conclusions about how well TCP really does or does not perform. And what we found is that out of the box, TCP indeed performs poorly, but it turns out it's not due to the expected reasons that people had. The actual reasons were somewhat different. Okay, so the actual reasons are that low pans have a small, L2 frame size, basically a small MTU, and this results in very high header overhead. The second problem is that hidden terminals are a serious issue for TCP when operating over multiple wireless hops. And finally, that the kind of scheduling at the link layer needed to support a low duty cycle and low energy consumption interact poorly with TCP. Now, there's a key difference between the issues on the left and the issues on the right. The issues on the left, if they were to exist, would be fundamental issues. There's no clear way to adapt TCP or the link layer to eliminate those issues. But the issues on the right, it turns out, are fixable within the paradigm of TCP via fairly straightforward techniques. So in our research, we show why the expected reasons don't actually apply. We demonstrate techniques to address the actual issues causing poor TCP performance. And our overall conclusion is that TCP can perform well in low pans after all. So that's an overview of what I'm going to be telling you about. Uh, and there are also, by the way, a set of techniques that we propose in order to make uh, low pans work well, which I'll go over in the course of the talk. OK, in the next part of the talk, I'm going to focus on the expected reasons for uh, why, uh, or why the expected reasons for poor performance don't apply. Um, and, and to go back here, I'll be talking about this technique in this part of the talk. And the reason is that this part of the talk is more about our experiments and our observations about the expected reasons. This technique has to do with our implementation, which is why it's included. I'll talk about the remaining techniques in the next part of the talk where I dive into how to affix the actual reasons for poor performance. So our methodology is based on a Hamilton platform, as I mentioned earlier. You can see the picture there. This is a Hamilton platform connected to a Raspberry Pi. And the Raspberry Pi is just there as a back channel to collect logs and so on and measurements. Uh, the TCP stack was, of course, running on the Hamilton platform directly. Um, our software stack is using OpenThread with Riot OS. And we used a wireless test bit to collect our data, where each of those numbers is one of our Hamilton nodes. Uh, the lines connecting them show an example of a topology. Uh, in reality, OpenThread is going to generate this dynamically. This is just a snapshot of what it might look like. 
And we ran TCP where one TCP endpoint is in the wireless mesh on one of the Hamilton nodes, and the other TCP endpoint is hosted on the cloud in Amazon EC2. So um, one of the first things we had to do was to implement TCP. Uh, now, as I mentioned earlier, there have been several prior attempts to use TCP in this space based on simplified embedded TCP stacks, but we wanted to use a full-scale TCP stack uh, in our study. Now, the challenge is that implementing a full-scale TCP stack is hard, and in fact, there's an entire RFC devoted to all, describing all the problems that people were seeing in full-scale TCP stacks back in 1999, even though these TCP stacks had matured for at least a decade by this point. So, um, our approach was not to implement a TCP stack from scratch since we felt it would be too error prone uh, to do. Instead, we started with the mature full-scale TCP implementation in FreeBSD and re-engineered key parts of it so it would work well on an embedded platform. And we call our resulting implementation TCP LP, where the LP stands for low power. So now that we have our implementation of TCP, we can concretely answer the question of what are the resource uh, requirements of running TCP. So what we found is that TCP LP requires 32 kilobytes of code memory and about half a kilobyte of data memory per connection to store all of the TCP connection state in a full-scale TCP implementation, while our platform has substantially more code and data memory than that. Now, as an optimization, we use separate structures for active sockets that are actually endpoints of a TCP connection and passive sockets that are just listening for new connections, which helps to save a bunch of memory as well. Um, but the point here is that, you know, at least in terms of connection state, we're well within the bounds of the available memory. So natural question is, what about the actual buffers used to send and receive data? So um, the TCP buffers need to be the bandwidth delay product in size in order to be able to send at full speed of the network. Uh, and we empirically determine the bandwidth delay product as two to three kilobytes. And we can see in the graph here how we experimentally did that. You can see a two to three kilobytes of buffer size, the available could put over TCP levels off. So, our conclusion here is that TCP, including the size of the buffers, fits comfortably in memory. And in fact, there's another conclusion to be drawn here, which is that if you notice, the, the size of the buffers is actually much bigger than the connection state, which suggests that most of the overhead of TCP doesn't come from the complexity of the protocol, it's from the buffers. And any performant bulk transfer protocol would need these buffers in order to transmit at the BDP. So in some sense, the overhead really isn't bottlenecked by TCP's complexity at all. Um, there's also some, uh, we also introduced a technique here in order to reduce the memory used for the buffers. Uh, and part of this has to rely on TCP having both a receive buffer and a reassembly buffer to store in sequence data and out of sequence data for reassembly. Now, full scale TCP stacks like FreeBSD use packet queues, use a separate queue of packets for each of these. But in the embedded uh, setting, we don't want to use dynamically allocated packets because if we hold on to dynamically allocated packets in a memory constrained setting, we may cause other memory allocations to fail. So we instead we want to use flat arrays. And the naive strategy would be to have a separate flat array for your receive queue and for your reassembly queue. Now to optimize this, what we observe is that there's an interesting relationship between the advertised window size, the number of bytes we currently have, and the total size of the buffer, which is that the number of received bytes plus the advertised window size is equal to the total size of a received buffer. Now, the observation we make on top of this is that all of the data we may possibly get for reassembly has to fit within the advertised window size. So that's the contract of TCP that if you're sending to a recipient, you do not go past their advertised window. So this allows us to actually store the received buffer and the reassembly queue in a single flat array. Okay, so. The way this works is that we have our flat array, and the yellow region with the start and end pointers is just a circular buffer to store our in-sequence data. And as we receive out-of-sequence data that needs to be reassembled, we store it in the same array past the end of the circular buffer using a bitmap to keep track of which of these bytes are active corresponding to received out-of-sequence data, and which of them are just empty slots on the array where new data can be stored. Okay, so in this way, we can significantly reduce the memory for buffers by in some sense not having to allocate a separate buffer for a reassembly queue and just sharing that with the buffer we've allocated for the received queue. Okay, next I'm going to talk about the wireless TCP problem. And before we talk about that, I need to tell you about the number of in-flight segments as that affects TCP's congestion control. So as I mentioned, the bandwidth delay product is two to three kilobytes. Each segment is sized to about 250 to 500 bytes. And this was chosen carefully. It's actually based on the technique I'll tell you about later on in the talk 
for coping with the small MTU of these networks. Uh, so we'll come back and explain this, but for now, take it as a given that our segments are 250 bytes to 500 bytes. And what this works out to is we have 4 to 12 in-flight TCP segments at any one point in time. Now, this is different from other higher bandwidth networks. You might imagine if you're transmitting over a higher bandwidth network or over a longer distance, you may have hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands of packets in flight. And in comparison, 4 to 12 is, is very small, and that profoundly affects how TCP's congestion control operates. So here uh, are some examples of how of TCP and Urino's behavior in a load band. And for now, I'll focus on the left graph. Um, here, uh, our maximum segment size is 462 bytes. Um, and what's going on, and when I say maximum segment size, I'm actually subtracting the space for TCP options. So this is how much data is sent in each TCP packet. And our bandwidth delay product is filled by just four TCP segments. So what ends up happening is that, yeah, we are, our losses are very frequent, but because we only need a connection window of four segments in order to fill up uh, the BDP and send it line rate, TCP's condition control actually uh, is actually able to recover from losses extremely quickly, and we spend most of our time actually sending at a full window, uh, despite the losses in the wireless medium being frequent. On the right, we have a more challenging scenario where we size our MSS to be smaller, and we use some active queue management, which induces some more loss events. But we still find that TCP is able to reach a, a full window and operate there most of the time, despite seeing frequent losses. So somewhat counterintuitively, we find that because our bandwidth in these networks is so small, our bandwidth delay product is small. And as a result, we can recover to a full BDP quickly after a loss. And this means that the wireless TCP problem actually does not affect TCP's performance significantly in these networks. Uh, and it's much more resilient to wireless losses in a low pan than it is in a higher bandwidth wireless network. So that was a surprising result, but one that works well for us because it removes one of the obstacles we'd ordinarily would have faced in getting TCP to work. So now I've talked about the expect why the expected reasons don't apply. In the next part of the talk, I'm going to tell you about the actual reasons for poor performance. And going back to our slide with our techniques on it, I'll be telling you about these three techniques. Now, there are a couple I didn't get to, the zero copy send buffer and the link leader queue management, and that's because I don't have the time in this talk to talk about it. But if you want to chat about it afterwards, I'll be around, or you or can look in the paper to find some details about those. So first, dealing with the MTU problem, here's a graphic showing the size of the MTU in Ethernet, Wi-Fi, and IEEE Intertuda 15.4, which is an example of a low pan link layer. And what we can see is that um, TCP IP headers are very small compared to the Ethernet and Wi-Fi MTUs, but they're significant compared to the IEEE Intertuda 15.4 MTU. And this is going to result in large header overhead. Okay, normally we size TCP segments to be as large as the link supports, but no larger. This is standard. This is what's used in Ethernet and Wi-Fi. But in the case of IEEE Intertuda 15.4, it's only 104 bytes, right? Our MTU is small. And our TCP IP headers can actually take up more than half of that if you include the cost of TCP options, even if you use a standard IP header compression that's part of 6 low band. And what that means is that if you're transmitting data in a TCP connection, more than half of the data you're setting out are just these headers, and your good put is severely affected by that. So in order to overcome this, we break this conventional wisdom and instead allow TCP LP to have TCP segments that span multiple link layer frames. Okay, what that means is that we're relying on the six low pan adaptation layer to handle fragmentation and reassembly for us, which adds some overhead. But it means that the overhead of our headers is now amortized over multiple frames, allowing us to get some good good put. Now, there is a trade off here. Um, if we use too much fragmentation, if we set our, our MTU, I mean, if we set our TCP segments to be way too large, what's going to end up happening is that we rely on too much fragmentation, and that's bad because now if one fragment gets lost, we lose the entire packet. So what we want to do is we want to choose our TCP segments to be as large as possible to effectively amortize the overhead without incurring more fragmentation beyond that. Okay, and this graph shows our experiment where we, where we measured the maximum segment size and the good put that results, and we found that the gains essentially level off around three to five frames. Uh, so that's what we use for our future experiments, and it shows that you know there's a good trade-off to be made here, where we can get good good put despite the despite the header sizes. Now, one thing that we didn't do but could potentially help in a way that's orthogonal to this is to 
get good TCP header compression, right? Because six low pen currently standardizes UDP header compression with six low pen, but not TCP header compression. And that's another opportunity to reduce these overheads further. Okay, now I'll talk about how the link layer scheduling to support a low duty cycle interacts poorly with TCP. So recall that these devices often don't have enough energy to keep the radios on and listening all the time. So we define the duty cycle as the proportion of time that the radio is listening or transmitting. Basically the percent of time where the radio is not in a low power sleep state. Okay, and in order to get good energy consumption, we want the duty cycle to be as close to zero as possible. Uh, now, there are several ways in order to support this uh, in the session of literature. OpenThread uses a particular duty cycling mechanism that's called a receiver-initiated duty cycle protocol, which I'll now explain. So in OpenThread, you have two kinds of nodes. You have battery-powered nodes, where we want to minimize the duty cycle, and wall-powered nodes that are plugged into a wall outlet and have enough power to keep their radios always on. Okay. Now, sending a frame from B to W is easy because W's radio is always on. So we can just send the frame whenever we like. More challenging is the reverse, getting a frame from W to B. Okay, so what has to happen is that W has to wait until B's radio is listening. And how does it know when B's radio is listening? Well, this is where the protocol comes in. What B does is that whenever it turns on its radio to listen for a, for a frame, it'll send a data request packet to W, informing it that it's now listening. So W has to wait until it gets its data request packet, and once it does, then it can go ahead and send the frame to B, and B will listen and receive the frame. Okay, so what's the key point here? The key point I wanna emphasize is that B's idle duty cycle is directly related to how frequently it sends data request frames. B can choose to send data request frames very rarely, which allows it to get very good energy consumption, but doing so would uh, but doing so would cause more of a delay in getting frames to it, since W has to wait for the data request frame in order to send it one of the, uh, one of the data frames. Okay, so now let me talk about what this means for TCP operation. And I'll do this by comparing HTTP over TCP to COAP. Okay, and COAP is a REST-based protocol running on top of UDP. And in our setup, we had B send W data request frame every one second. Basically, it basically listen for packets every one second, and that allows it to get a really low duty cycle. Now, the key difference between HTTP and COAP here is that HTTP requires two round trips, whereas COAP only requires one round trip. Okay, so for the first round trip, right, you start at a random uh, phase within the hundred millis uh, within the thousand millisecond sleep interval. So you'd expect, on average, a five hundred millisecond delay, and COAP is consistent with that. For HTTP, what happens is that for the first round trip, we see five hundred milliseconds. But the second round trip starts right at the beginning of the next sleep interval. So the second round trip consistently sees the worst case latency when transmitting the packet from W to B. Okay, and as a result, HTTP performs more than twice as poorly as COAP uh, on this workload. Now I want to point out that there have been some recent extensions to TCP, for example, TCP fast open, which you can use to eliminate the second round trip and get performance parity between COAP and HTTP. But this problem also happens for bulk transfers, where the act clock nature of TCP causes it to consistently experience the worst case latency, even for bulk transfers. So this is an important problem to solve regardless of that. And our approach to solving it is to use an adaptive duty cycle. The idea is that we can use the TCP and HTTP protocol state in order to vary how often we send data request frames. The idea being, when we expect a packet, we want to send data request frames more frequently. So for example, if I'm an HTTP server of one of these battery powered devices, and I just accepted a TCP connection, I can be pretty sure that, the, that I'm gonna soon receive an HTTP request on that connection. So I may choose to send data request frames more frequently at that point in time. And doing this nearly entirely eliminates the gap between co-op and HTTP in terms of performance. So if we zoom out and look at the overall network, this adaptive duty cycle technique works well for the last hop, going from a wall-powered node to a battery-powered node. But the overall network still has to operate over multiple wireless hops to even get to that last hop. And what we observed is that TCP performs poorly over this chain of wall-powered nodes due to hidden terminals. Uh, so let me step back and go over hidden terminals to provide some background on that for those who aren't familiar with it. Uh, we can understand the wireless range of a node as looking something like this, 
uh, the unit just models a simplification where we consider this to be in some sense a perfect circle. Uh, in practice, of course, it can be more complex depending on the exact environment your deployment is in. Uh, but unit disk model is, is going to be enough for us to capture the phenomena of interest here. So we'll go with that. Um, so imagine you have four segments in a line. I mean, four, four nodes in a line with their, uh, with their transmission ranges shown here. And we want to transmit data from A to D. Now, the nature of TCP is that uh, we have multiple segments in flight at the same time for a single connection. And that's why we have segment one being sent from C to D and segment two being sent from A to B. But unfortunately, this is bad because the wireless ranges are going to overlap at B. So the two packets are going to interfere there. OK, now in the context of Wi-Fi, we typically overcome this using a protocol based on RTS and CTS frames that allow us to mitigate the hidden terminal problem in most cases. But in the context of low pens, the small MTU means that RTS CTS typically has too high of an overhead. As a result, most uses of it don't use RTS and CTS packets. Uh, so as a result, we're only relying on CSMA, right? So at A, CSMA can't detect uh, C's transmission because uh, it's all the way, uh, because A is out of range of C. And CSMA at C can't detect A's transmission because C is out of range of A. But both of the packets end up interfering at B and the packet gets lost. Um, this also happens because of data packets and acts going in opposite directions. So for example, here, uh, what we'll ultimately see is that um, you get the same problem with B and D both sending at the same time to C because each of their CSMAs can't hear the other. So to mitigate this, our approach is to add a new random backoff delay between link layer retries. Okay, so the idea is if you transmit a frame and it fails, which you know because you don't get a link layer acknowledgement for it, then you wait a random amount and retry the transmission. And this is different from CSMA in two respects. The first respect is that in CSMA, uh, you do this randomized uh, delay with exponential backoff if the channel appears busy. In this case, even if the channel appears clear, if a transmission fails, we still do the backoff. So it's different in regards of what triggers the transmission. And second, it's a much longer delay, right? Because in CSMA, you can rely on hearing a concurrent transmission. You can transmit immediately if the channel appears clear. In this new delay that we're adding, this link retry delay, what we're seeing is that we want to have uh, a delay that's chosen between zero and 10 times the time to transmit a frame. The idea being, even if there are two concurrent transmissions that can't hear each other, with high probability they won't overlap in time. Okay, so um, the way this would work is that uh, each of these two nodes would send its data once in order to go, and they would, and they would collide. But then when they retry, they'll transmit a second time at hopefully different intervals, and they won't overlap in time, and the transmission will succeed. Okay, so um, we did a measurement study to understand what kind of link delays would be appropriate and what would work. What we observe is that there's a huge reduction in packet loss, even from a small delay. And as if you increase the delay too much, it starts to eat away at your good foot, because now you're waiting a lot when transmitting your packets. So we found that there's a sweet spot here at around 40 milliseconds, which is about 10 times the time to transmit a single frame in IEEE 2.15.4. Uh, so that's what we used in our study. Um, and this reduced the packet loss rate from 6% to 1%, which, was, which we consider a significant improvement. So finally, I want to summarize our evaluation and, and conclusions. So first, I previewed this result at the beginning. We're able to achieve significantly higher good foot than prior attempts at using TCP. And we're very close to a reasonable upper bound that we computed based on measurements of how fast the radio can send out packets and the overhead loss to headers and acts. Um, we also did a measurement study to study the energy efficiency. So we used TCP and COAP for a sense and send task and measured the radio duty cycle over a 24 hour period. And you can see the radio duty cycle here. The key point is that TCP is not significantly worse than COAP. In fact, they perform comparably for the duration of the experiment at about a 2% duty cycle. And we consider this a success because TCP is able to perform essentially on par as a protocol over UDP developed specifically for low bands. So now that TCP is a viable option, what does this mean? Well, first, we should reconsider the use of lightweight protocols that emulate part of TCP's functionality um, in the sense that you know, if you have a protocol that's specialized and performs just as well as a general protocol that's more interoperable and used more broadly, 
we should perhaps prefer the one that's used more broadly and is more interoperable. Second, we think that TCP may influence the design of low-pan network systems in the sense that, you know, for a long time, it's been the case that many smart home devices that you buy on the market require a specialized gateway to get internet connectivity. Um, and TCP gives us the opportunity to allow these devices to connect end-to-end -to, -end to any uh, services externally that they may depend on. And finally, I just want to mention that UDP-based protocols, I think, will still be used in low pens, but just in the same sense that they're used broadly in the internet for applications where specialized protocols substantially outperform TCP. Uh, in cases where TCP performs on par with the specialized protocols, using TCP is now a viable option. So just to, to talk a little more about the, about the middle point, about how TCP may influence the design of low pan network systems, when I say gateway architecture, I mean a setup like this, where you have your devices, these smart home devices you bought on the market, and in order to allow them to communicate with an application server in a data center somewhere, you have to install some specific gateway in your home that is some protocol translation and application logic in order to bring connectivity to those devices. Uh, what this means is, is often the case, and some of you may have experienced this, is that if you go buy smart devices from a new vendor, uh, now all of a sudden you need another gateway for those new devices, or even maybe the newer versions of devices from the same vendor. Like for example, uh, for a long time, it was a case that for life, that if you have bulbs from say LifeX and bulbs from Philips, you would need separate gateways for both of those devices. Um, so uh, the, the introduction of IP in this space didn't really change this in the sense that now your application protocol on the left is now implemented over IP, but you still need the application layer gateway. And the missing piece, I think, that would allow an end-to-end -end, uh, connection here would be to have a transfer protocol that's supported on both sides, namely TCP. And once you do this, your application layer gateways become regular border routers, and you can potentially consolidate these together into a single border router. So um, in conclusion, uh, we implemented TCP LP, a full-scale TCP stack for low-pan devices. Uh, we explain why the expected reasons for poor TCP performance don't apply. Uh, we show how to address the actual reasons for poor TCP performance, and we show that once the issues are resolved, TCP can perform comparably to low-pan specialized protocols. Uh, that's all I have prepared, and I'm happy to take any questions now. Okay. Um, thank you, um, Sam, that, that's for, for that ex excellent talk. Um, I see we have a, a couple of people in the online queue and a couple of people at the microphone. Um, should we do the, uh, uh, I guess that we'll do the, the microphone first, so uh, I can see who that is, but if, if you can go ahead and, and say, say your name and your question. Yeah, yeah. So, hi, I'm Matthias. Uh, I'm one of the co-founders of Wired Great Work. Thanks a lot. Um, one remark and two questions. Uh, question first, um, so you argued that uh, supporting TCP is important because it's popular. Now quick becomes popular. Did you work on any comparison from a system point of view? Um, sorry, I didn't quite hear what, what you said becomes popular. Uh, you said that TCP is popular, but quick also becomes popular in the internet. Quick, you know? Uh, uh, quick, so oh, oh, transfer, quick. Uh, quick, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. did you any comparison? Uh, so we didn't do a comparison against quick, but I'd like to comment on that because that's a good point that other, other transports are becoming popular. Many of the issues that we addressed aren't specific to TCP. They apply broadly to TCP and other protocols needed for bulk transfer. Like for example, um, the, the main issues, getting it to work with hidden terminals, getting it to play well with link layer scheduling and so on, apply broadly to any protocol that's transmitting a lot of data and wants a significant amount of bandwidth. Therefore, I think that many of our conclusions would actually apply equally well to click as they do to TCP. Okay. Um... And another question, I mean, in your paper, you note that you also have an implementation for GNRC, the default network stack and wide. Do you also plan to submit a PR to upstream the implementation? Um, at some point we did have plans for that, but what happened is that Riot OS already adopted a different TCP stack and it seemed a bit redundant to contribute a second one. Uh, recently, what we have done is we have, we have also contributed our code to OpenThread, which now uses it as its default TCP stack. Okay. I still I highly encourage you to submit a PM. Uh, and final remark, um, you said that uh, a fragment needs to be, uh, a packet needs to be, is lost when the fragment is lost. I mean, this depends a little bit on the fragmentation screen, right? If you consider, for example, selective uh, fragment recovery, um, 
it doesn't matter too much whether the fragment is lost or not for the whole packet. Yeah, so um, my understanding about the way six load plan worked, or at least the way it was implemented in the operating systems we looked at, was indeed that if a fragment is lost, you lose the whole packet. But I do agree that there are protocols you can use to recover a lost fragment without losing the entire packet. And those could also help with the problem, allowing you to make the packet bigger and amortize TCP IP headers even better. All right, hello. Um, Tommy Pauly from Apple. Thank you for doing this talk. Um, very interesting. I'm you know, super happy to see the use of TCP here. Um, I just had a couple questions from the presentation. Um, way earlier, and you don't have to go back, we, when you're talking about um, the memory saving aspects and the ability to have the flat buffer, you had the diagram there of, you know, essentially here's kind of what's in flight, and then there's the out of order bits. And there are gaps in there as well. Um, when you're doing this, are you able to essentially guarantee 100% of the time that you'll never need to allocate memory, or is it like just most of the time, and then there would be a failover case where you do need to have dynamic allocation? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, we ensure that you never have to dy dynamically allocate memory. Cool. And the way we do it is that you store the data there. You have a bitmap to keep track of which bits contain mm -hmm. the out of order data. But the bitmap can also be sized statically because it depends only on the array size, which is also static. Got it. OK, cool. Um, and then the other question is more about kind of what you're ending with, talking about how you can use this to get to internet hosts end to end. Um, and I believe in your tests, you were testing against um, end to end internet connections. For that, do you need to modify anything? on the TCP implementation, on the internet servers, like as we were mentioning, things like timing, the retransmit timing schedules that you want to add randomness so you're not colliding. Um, is this something that needs tuning on the internet hosts to make sure that they are friendly to the low pan devices, or can you use completely unmodified um, internet hosts to talk to? Yeah. That's an excellent question. And the short answer is that the hosts on the Linux side were completely unmodified. Great. Um, cool. I mean, that's uh, to say a little bit more about that. Uh, the timing that we adjusted for like the randomized delay was not at the TCP level, it was at the link layer. So as a result, the, the other side uh, actually doesn't see any of that. Got it. Um, this is also one of the advantages to us using a full scale TCP stack like the one from FreeBSD because it's been battle tested in the real world and it's interoperable with all of the major TCP stacks that are out there. And I just want to say that uh, interoperability is actually a problem in the embedded space. Many of the embedded TCP stacks you find are, have, inter have interoperability problems in pretty subtle ways with the real TCP stacks that are used. And that's something we managed to sidestep by using a battle-tested TCP implementation as the basis of our study. Cool. Thank you. So hello, this is Thomas, <clears throat> also from the Riot community. Thanks again for this work. Thanks for using Riot. Uh, there's uh, another encouragement using GenRC because you have a generic pa packet buffer here, which you could re reuse that even reduces your memory overhead even further. Uh, uh, just just a remark. Uh, one question about, uh, about your uh, multi-hop experiments. Um, you showed us nicely how by jittering the, the TCP forwarding, the, how you could avoid the hidden terminal problem. Was that in a clean environment without cross traffic, with only a single TCP connection? Yeah, so uh, the hidden terminal problem affects even a single TCP connection in isolation. Um, and we verified that our randomized back off fixes the problem in that case. Yeah, but only in this case. I mean, the normal case is that you have background traffic, right? So, yeah. yeah, yeah. So, I mean, if we have background traffic, this is also why we used randomized delays instead of fixed delays. Because if, if you had a randomized back off, it doesn't matter if the interference is coming from the same stream or a different stream, right? In yes. both cases, you'll back off a random amount and hopefully transmit again without colliding. Um, this is also why we did it without, because I mean, there are several protocols you could use that look at TCP state in some way. Um, and having it just be a randomized delay of the link layer gives us some confidence that it would work across TCP streams and regardless of the source of traffic, whether it's TCP, different TCP streams, or even something else. Uh, in this context, did you also consider uh, uh, experimenting with more flexible uh, um, link layer, MAC layers than uh, 
just a CSMA CA, for instance, the DSME uh, Mac layer, which is also supported by Riot? No, we didn't experiment with that. Uh, we looked at CSMA because that was the most common one supported across all the operating systems and networking protocols that we tried across Tiny OS, Riot, and OpenThread. Uh, mm -hmm. So it seemed most natural to focus on that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think we have a, a remote question. Am I unmuted finally? So uh, this is following up on the multi-hop case. Uh, so in these environments, the uh, forwarding devices are in fact also very low power, low uh, resource devices. Um, did you see or could you speculate on what you might see as to whether TCP traffic would have more stress on the buffers uh, of the forwarding multi-hop wireless nodes? Uh, so, so that's a great question. Um, first, I want to, I mean, so, so first, I just want to clarify that the buffers used at the intermediate routers, these aren't TCP layer buffers, these are just like the, the general packet buffers used for forwarding because, you know, in an end to end TCP connection, there's no TCP state. At sure, the sure, 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 sure. But it may put a different, yeah. may put a different low aggregate load um, on those buffers than, say, co op traffic or something that's more, you know, simple request response related. Yeah, so, I mean, of course, it's the case that when you're transmitting at higher bandwidth, you're going to place some more stress on the on the buffers of the intermediate uh, of the intermediate routers. And there are a couple things that, that we do in that we actually did in our study in order to help mitigate that. The first one is that we added some active queue management functionality to those intermediate routers where you mark packets as congested using explicit using explicit congestion notification and so on in order to prevent TCP from filling up the entire buffer and keeping your queues short. Um, the primary reason we did this was to improve fairness of different TCP flows that are competing for buffer space of these intermediate routers, and also to reduce the and also to reduce the latency of traffic. Uh, but it also has a side effect of limiting the amount of buffer space that's being used by a single TCP flow to address some of the concerns that you brought up. Thanks. I was looking for the AQM uh, angle on that. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, so, so I, I have a question. Um, does the uh, so I, 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 I very much like the idea of uh, letting the the header spend multiple linked layer frames. Um, does this put any constraints on on the link layer, or or does the six low pan layer um, sort of ha ha handle all of that? Um, that's a great question. So some of these uh, can potentially be handled at the six low pan layer, but others do indeed have to do with the, with, the, uh, with the link layer directly. Like for example, the randomized delay that we added to avoid hidden terminals is something that would operate at the link layer, right? Because at the six little band layer, uh, you don't have, or at least you don't naturally have the same kind of visibility into you know, when your link layer acts are coming in and so on. Whereas you would need that to determine uh, that a transmission failed and how much to back off on the retransmission and so on. So some of them do indeed affect the link layer. Yeah, uh, are the requirements that the link layer delivers packets in order um, to, to avoid um, damaging the headers, or, or is six low pan handling that? Uh, sorry, I didn't, I didn't understand your question. Uh, is there a requirement that the link layer delivers packets in order, in order you know, because of the way you've uh, sent the headers split across multiple link layer frames, um, or is that all the, the reordering handled by six low pan? Oh yeah, so, so the reordering and reassembly is handled by six low pan, and there's no strict requirement that you have to transmit the frames of a packet directly one after the other consecutively. In fact, one of the things that I skipped because of the time limit was another set of techniques we have uh, at the level of managing how to deal with concurrent frames, basically how to schedule frames when some of them are going to other wall power devices, some to battery powered devices. And in effect, what we do is if you, if you receive a your data request frame from a battery powered device, then you prioritize sending frames to that in order to reduce its duty cycle and let it go to sleep as fast as possible. And that's one case where we specifically might interrupt another transmission and not send its frames concurrently. I mean, not send its frames consecutively. Oh, okay, yeah, that, that makes sense. Okay. Uh, Gabrielle, do you have a question? Me? Do you hear me one? Okay. Um, yeah, thank you very much for 
for this work. This is this is great stuff. Um, I did have a comment on um, the comparison with Coap. I think the justification for Coap was not entirely based on um, we can't use TCP type type thing. It was more based on we can't use HTTP because the, the justification for it was for folks who wanted to use a, a RESTful interface for the application layer. Not every application layer in IoT wishes to do that, but there's certainly a lot uh, of a, a lot of incentive to use RESTful. So uh, when when um, the RESTful folks started uh, uh, to become interested in IoT, the only alternative was HTTP 1.1, which uh, I completely agree is terrible. Uh, it's non-starter, it's textual based protocol, you cannot uh, compress it, it's it's very verbose, et cetera. It's, it's terrible. Um, we subsequently had HTTP2, which became a binary protocol, and we actually had a paper uh, three years ago in ANRW about uh, you know how to use that over something like six low band, for example. Uh, some just initial scratch on the surface, but now we have HTTP3 and quick and it's all binary. So um, um, I um, I understand you you guys haven't had a chance to go after the excellent work you've done to look at those layers, but I would highly encourage you to do that because that would that would address um, a significant portion of the uh, of the application layer incentives um, to um, uh, for, for IoT as well. Yeah. So, uh, so thanks for for clarifying that. Um, I do acknowledge that Coop has has evolved quite a bit in a few years. Some of those evolutions happened after after we published this work. Uh, but I do want to, uh, to to clarify my position on Coop a little bit uh, based on what you said. It's that uh, indeed I think that Coop is useful and it has its uses and it is very flexible. It's been evolving a lot over the years and that's great. Um, I do. I mean, I have noticed that Coop has been evolving in some sense more and more towards the same kind of abstraction that TCP provides, right? In some sense, uh, the ability, like for example, with some of the recent work on on streaming on streaming block transfers and so on. Um, all I'm saying here is that I think that an application that's built on Coop in these kinds of networks with all the latest features, like for example, the ability to have multiple blocks in flight uh, concurrently and so on would also be wise to potentially consider using TCP directly itself, given that TCP is also a viable option in these networks. But thanks for that comment. All right, thank you. Uh, one, one final question. Uh, Benjamin uh, Zeltz on the closet. Hi, thank you so much for the presentation. I really appreciate it. Um, I was just wondering, you talked mainly about the applications of this in um, in LANs, do you see any application for longer range networks like um, like mobile ad hoc networks or anything of that sort? Uh, that's a great question. So all of our experimentation was uh, was done using IEEE Intertuta 15.4, which is a personal area network protocol. And that was motivated by the recent interest in, ad in adopting some of that technology uh, to work in the smart home and IoT space. Um, some of the, I mean, so, some of these lessons might carry over to the mobile and, and, and ad hoc network space like LP WANs and so on. Um, I'm not sure I'll be able to tell you any specifics given that I don't have much experience with those networks. Um, but I mean, my first gut would be there's probably a way to make TCP work well, given that it's been adapted to work in so many different kinds of networks uh, in all kinds of different environments. Uh, but other than that, I'm not sure if any of this, which of the specific techniques would directly carry over there. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, thank, thank you very much uh, for the talk. Uh, excellent talk. Uh, uh, and thank you again to to both of the speakers. I think there, there were two two really great talks there. Um, both uh, Sam and Tasha will be ar around all week. Uh, I'm sure they'll be very happy to, to talk with people more about their work. Uh, so so pl please do, do find them, have a ch chat about their work, make them welcome to the, the IETF and to the IRTF. Uh, congratulations both to uh, Sam and to Tasha for the award of the ANRP this time. Um, 
as I said earlier, look out for um, more ANRP award talks um, at the, the uh, ITF 15 in London in November. Uh, the nominations for the uh, 2023 uh, ANRP awards will be opening in September. So um, if, if you know any good work, please think about nominating that work. Uh, and look out for the uh, Applied Networking Research Workshop, which is taking place uh, co-locating with the ITF in, in Philadelphia tomorrow. Um, thank you again, everybody. Um, hopefully, uh, I will see some or all of you in London or at the ANRW tomorrow or later this week. Thanks, everyone.